Hello again. Welcome to Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Welcome again to our new time. This is the second week being on at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Trying to better fit everyone's schedules and have a little bit of mercy on our friends from the Western time zones who come on the show from time to time. We hope you can make it a point to join us here as we stream live every Tuesday at this time. If you ever miss a show, by the way, the live streams are archived on YouTube and we post Digging Deeper as an audio podcast too, but you're here now. And on behalf of everyone at Cornette, we welcome you to the big show. Today on the program, Tom Webster, the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Marketing for Edison Research is here. He is fresh off the release of 2021's edition of The Infinite Dial, his company's annual survey of consumer behavior conducted with Triton. Uh, this research is the most important and useful look at how consumers in the United States are using technology and social media, especially mediums like podcasting and social networks. So it's a must review for me. I think it should be for you too. So we're going to touch on what insights we can glean from the survey this year. Very helpful for your marketing planning strategy and decision making. I also want to touch on an interesting reaction to the pending privacy improvements coming to the web. Thanks to companies like Google and Apple taking stances against third party advertising tracking. Uh, Tom Webster and I incidentally have a mutual friend in Christopher Penn. He's been on this program before and is by anyone's standards, an expert on marketing and advertising analytics. He thinks one important area of growth that will come from increased privacy standards is influencer marketing. So I'll explain a little bit more about that later on in the show. Today's episode of Digging Deeper is brought to you by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. It's available now from Entrepreneur Press. You can find it in bookstores everywhere. Uh, if you're watching live online, you can see that I have a special place to go online and get a discount. For those of you listening on the recording later, I'll have that discount for you in just a second. So get ready to jot down a note. Winfluence the book is not just a strategic blueprint to help you employ smart influence marketing strategies for your business or clients, but it explains why our common perception of influence marketing is all wrong. I take you through how to rethink and reframe the concepts to turn influence -er marketing into influence marketing, broaden the perspective and open new avenues of leveraging influential people online and offline to grow your business. The special URL is on your screen. If you're listening, that URL is jason.online slash buy winfluence. That's jason.online slash buy winfluence. That takes you to the book on the Entrepreneur Press bookstore. Buy the book and use the code FALLS20. That's all caps, F-A-L-L-S-2-0 and get 20% off the retail price. That address again, jason.online slash buy Winfluence. If you are dialing into the live broadcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, you can jump in the comments section there or hit at reply on Twitter and ask questions and interact with us here on the show. Jump in the comments and say hello or ask your question. It looks as if uh, the interwebs are functioning appropriately. Uh, jumping in and I see Izzy House is already in saying good morning. Good morning, Izzy. She's commenting on LinkedIn today as per usual for her. Uh, so jump in and say hello. And of course, if you have comments or questions about the research that we're about to go over with Tom Webster, uh, you can jump in the comments there and ask your questions. Now, before I bring uh, Tom on, I have to share something with you very quickly that Tom will appreciate, I'm sure. Yesterday, uh, one of my colleagues, Josh Crandall, stopped by and gave me a sticker he knew I would appreciate. And I know uh, Tom will appreciate it today, too. Uh, it, it says... Base your customer journey on effing research. And so when it comes to data and research, the person that I often turn to for that is Tom Webster. He is here with us today. Tom, good morning. How are you, sir? I'm outstanding, Jay. It's good to see you again. <laughs> good to see I've you. I've missed your smiling face. It has been a while. Uh, I usually make it to Boston once a year or so. And then we, of course, used to cross paths a lot at other conferences. So it has been far too long to see you and your lovely wife. And so I'm hoping to get back up there soon, but I'm glad to have you on the show today. Um, Thanks for having me. When it comes to, uh, as I was telling people, uh, you know, when it comes to data and consumer research, the, the infinite dial for me has become kind of the calendar mark every year of I got to stop and block out the time and watch the live thing and and hear what Tom and, uh, and your colleague at Triton there have to say and and soak it all up. And then I immediately like 
type up notes and share with the agency and whatnot. But for those who don't have a familiarity with the infinite dial, give us the elevator pitch on what it is, how the data is gathered, and who might benefit from understanding it. So the infinite dial is the longest running study of consumer media habits and uh, r related around media and technology in America. And it's been running continuously since 1998. There's no other kind of rich longitudinal mine of data like that. And I've been involved with it since 2004. So I've got a very broad perspective. You know, some of the things that we have tracked, uh, we have literally tracked since 1998, which make these incredibly long graphs that uh, I'm sure you've seen where we track, you know, internet radio and things like that from uh, a rounding error to the, the majority as they are today. Um, and the reason why it's in, become, I think, an important bellwether for so many media industries, social media, uh, podcasting, a lot of uh, many uh, companies in the audio space use it, is because we we take it extraordinarily seriously in terms of the pains we take to get it right. We continue to use telephone-based sampling, which today is over half mobile phone, which is enormously expensive to do. Um, and in fact, uh, that the percentage of surveys that we execute each year via mobile phone is uh, in keeping with the industry standard percentages for that, which your viewers may be interested in knowing, come from the CDC. The CDC actually maintains the most accurate records of who is landline only, who is mobile phone only, who has both. Uh, but all of that sampling is incredibly expensive to make sure that it's representative and projectable to the U.S. population so that so many of the industries that rely on these numbers, we see them in media kits, we see them in uh, business plans, uh, can in fact rely on them as as accurate projectors of consumer behavior. Well, and, and I think that's the the important part for me is, you know, you see a lot of, of statistics and results and surveys and whatnot from software companies in this business. Um, and, you know, the, the one factor for me that separates the infinite dial is it is done by a professional research firm, Edison Research, and it is, you know, weighed and whatnot to compare with the U.S. population. So it's not 25 percent of those surveyed. It's projectable to 25 percent of all Americans, which is a very different way to read the data. Correct? Correct. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I often like to say, I don't think there's any such thing as a terrible survey. What typically fails is the reporting of that survey. Mm -hmm. And it actually takes a great deal of time and treasure to be able to say that a survey is representative of Americans. And in, in the case of the infinite dial, Americans 12 plus, as opposed to the people we interview or uh, respondents. Right. Chip Griffin jumping in to say hello. I know you know Chip as well. He, hello, Chip. he says he's late to the party, but thought he'd check in for a bit at least. So good, good stuff's over, Chip, but welcome. <laughs> All right. So it might be that I'm fixated on the topic of podcasts this year because I'm producing two of my own, but it looks like the big headline of this year's data might be focused on just that. I want to show some of the, the data as we talk about it here. So uh, podcasts are continuing uh, tremendous growth. And if I can hit the right buttons, I'll get that up there. This is uh, the the percentage of people who have ever listened to a podcast and it continues to grow. I wanted to ask you while we were looking at this chart, why do we ask the question or why do you ask the question? Uh, have you ever listened to a podcast? I, from my perspective, that seems like somewhat superficial and not very useful data, but I know there's good reasons why you track that. Yeah, there's a great reason for it. And it really comes down to really kind of an old, you know, agency stalwart for measuring media, and that's awareness, trial, and usage. Uh, and what's interesting to us is not by itself the percentage of people who say they've ever listened to a podcast, but the relationship of that percentage to those who say they've listened in the last month to those who've listened in the last week. Uh, and when you see those weekly numbers really starting to approach the, the ever numbers, that's a truly mature medium. Uh, but when you see the monthly numbers start to approach those ever numbers, then that's you know, it's more than just something people have experimented with, but it's starting to become more and more part of their everyday life. Right. So we've got on on this chart, the ever listened to is is 57 percent of those surveyed, I believe, if I'm reading that right. And then if we jump over to the next chart, which is the percent who have listened in the last month, it's not too much of a drop off there. Forty one percent. That's a good number. No, it's not too much of a drop off at all. And and I know you'll get to the weekly numbers in a minute. I think uh a lot of that has been sort of driven weekly up by the, the numbers of people that have picked up podcasting as a much more regular habit. Uh, I think a part of that has been 
the and it's not a huge part, but a noticeable part has been the influx of daily news podcasts that have that have become more and more part of everybody's habit and habitual lives. Uh, but it is in fact not a huge difference, as you point out. We crested a hundred million there a couple of years ago, uh, which is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, that's there. There was a time back in the early, uh, really in the early twenty tens. I don't know what we call those anymore. The tens, I guess. Um, <laughs> where you know podcasting from an agency perspective was definitely an experimental spend uh but you know there are uh, podcast networks now that are legitimately reaching a, you know a, a quarter of podcast listeners just by themselves in terms of uh, weekly listeners and becomes a very attractive by its scale as well so I, I actually don't have the chart ready to to throw up here for people i can i can jerry rig it in a way but uh, just to to talk about the weekly podcast listing numbers Percentage listened to a podcast in the last week is at 28% now, which is an estimated 80 million people. So again, not a huge drop. Your People are listening to podcasts with much regularity these days. Yeah, and that's really been the most significant gain, I think, in, in terms of a percentage increase is with those weekly listeners. It's gone from 24 to 28. So, you know, we're starting to get to three in 10 Americans who listen to a podcast every week. And again, we survey all Americans, including those who don't even have internet access, which is about 10% of the country. So uh, there is a cap on podcasting. Certainly podcasts to date are largely spoken word audio, because uh, mm -hmm. if you podcast licensed music without paying royalties, a lawyer will shoot you in the face. <laughs> um, but there's still, I think, a long way to go for podcasting in terms of the appetite for spoken word programming in this country. And ultimately, a podcast is, you know, it's content you want to listen to where and when you want to listen to it. And that's really a fairly universal behavior. That's why we started tracking it low those many years ago. <laughs> Chip chimes in here. I find current podcast growth interesting given the drop off of commutes and gym time, both of which were presumed to be big drivers of listen time. Have you looked into, you know, where and when people are actually listening to podcasts? Yes, we have, Chip. <laughs> um, so it's it, we actually track these things very, very closely besides the infinite dial, which is an annual study. We have a couple of syndicated studies, one called Share of Year, which comes up quarterly, and one called the Podcast Consumer Tracker, which is also a quarterly syndicated study. And in those two studies, we are literally sampling people every single day. They're, those are continuous daily sampled projects. So we were able to watch in excruciating detail uh, how habits changed when many of us became uh, confined to quarters last March and, uh, and, and how things have changed ever since then. Um, and some of the big changes certainly revolve around the car. You know, if, if in the infinite dial, one of the percentages that went down was the percentage of Americans who have ridden or driven in a car in, uh, in the last year, which is not something that typically ever changes. It's usually around 88, 89, and, and it dropped uh, a bit this year. I myself have neither ridden or driven in a car since last November. Um, <laughs> And of all of the, the levers on the various activities that we enjoy in terms of media consumption, it is the location of listening that is the biggest lever on those changes. And when we see overall changes as a result of uh, things like COVID-19 related quarantines, those changes have really come about because we are spending more time at home than we are in the car. And the actual in-car listening habits have not changed. And the actual at-home listening habits have not changed too much. But in-car and at-home are so different that the amount of time that we have spent home is in fact uh, sort of put top-down changes on that. And the one thing I would say in terms of podcasting is that at the beginning of quarantine, podcast consumption went down quite a bit. And I think any of the leading networks would tell you that their downloads uh, took quite a haircut in March and April. Uh, without a doubt, we were all watching Tiger King. Um, and, <laughs> well, we are. We were watching a ton of streamed video at that time. We yeah. had sort of uh, as much of a uh, vacation from life as we were going to get. And then gradually, as we became acclimated to working at home, acclimated to having our own homeschools for many of us, mm -hmm. uh, and acclimated to this kind of post-quarantine life, we began to carve back those spaces. So uh, the things that were predominantly focused in car, like AM, FM, radio, continue to be down from where they were a year ago. But things like podcasts and music consumption and audiobooks actually came back. And today, podcast listening in terms of hours per week is actually higher than it was before the pandemic as people have kind of clawed back, you know, that me time that they that they lacked in the uh, early parts of last year. 
Yeah. Brandon Arve uh, jumps in and says, uh, first of all, says hello, but that also says podcasts are a great alternative to office radios that used to be all tuned to oldies radio stations. And uh, of course, as we've been able to control that radio station at home, I think that uh, might, uh, you know, equate to a higher podcast listenership because, you know, if you're working at home and you don't have a lot of other people in the room, or if you're using your headphones, you can listen to what you want instead of what's going on in the room at, at the office. Yeah, you know, we did a study a, a few years ago uh, that was called the Commuter Code, and it, it was a combination of a national online survey and some observational work. We actually mounted GoPro cameras into the uh, into the dashboards, basically, of a sample of commuters, hmm. um, and we had them aim those cameras either at their AM FM radio, if that was their uh, principal form of uh, entertainment, or aim it at their smartphone or whatever they were typically using. And one of the things that we learned from all of this is the more options you have, the more technology you have at home, in your car, wherever, uh, in terms of media choices, the less switching you do. Hmm. And to some people that's counterintuitive. They might think, well, now that I have all of these choices, I'm gonna hop around all the time. But that's not what happens. When you have all of those choices available, what happens is you find exactly what you wanna listen to. Uh, and you maximize that behavior, you maximize that listening occasion. And, you know, getting that technology into the cars with podcasts and things like that have given people those sort of long bouts of exactly what they want to hear. Chip says, be careful where you aim those GoPros. Um, let's uh, let's move on to a slightly different topic now. Um, online audio listening uh, is another thing that you guys do a great job of tracking. This is not necessarily uh, an area that I pay a whole lot of attention to. I've never cared for the Pandoras or Spotify's. I have my music on my phone. I listen there and prefer to control what I enjoy, but that's just me. Uh, it, but it is a great opportunity area for brands and advertisers um, and that is streaming audio. And so the weekly online audio listening, again, continues to grow. And it's up to 176 million people now. That's that's a lot of people listening to these streaming services and a great opportunity for brands. Yeah. And I think from a brand perspective, you know, a lot of that is, you know, certainly there's the terrestrial radio streams online are part of that. Uh, but a big part of that are the pure plays like Spotify, Pandora. Uh, Spotify obviously has a huge premium component to it, as does the online aspect to Sirius XM. Um, but when you look at the non, the ad supported components of that, uh, with really Pandora being the most prominent, I think that's an incredible environment for a brand because number one, it's uh, a very ad Spartan environment, I think, especially compared to AM FM radio in terms of the number of ads and the number of ads in a pod of advertising. Uh, and then, you know, number two, there's, a, I think, a relationship that the listener has uh, to that form of audio. Sometimes it's because they're listening in headphones, uh, sometimes, but not always, because they're listening by themselves. Uh, and it becomes actually a really nice environment for well-branded, from an audio perspective, um, advertising and messaging. And I know uh, the folks at, uh, at most of the leading audio, streaming audio pure play providers do a great job kind of matching the messaging of a brand to the environment that it sits in. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's actually a really nice environment, I think, for messages. So what can a brand do with this high level information, really? I mean, knowing, you know, a lot of people listen to Spotify or Pandora or other online audio brands out there is one thing. But knowing if my audience listens to and which one they listen to is another, is that something that companies can discover through Edison or is that information they need to perhaps endure a sales pitch from the audio companies to find out what what can a brand manager do with this high level information? Well, increasingly, a sales pitch from one of those top audio companies involves Edison. So I'll, I'll see you down the road uh, at some point. Um, but what I would encourage agencies and brands to do is, and I'm not just saying that because they're, they're my clients, is to listen to them when they tell you about constructing uh, native advertising for their medium, for their environment. That's true of streaming audio. That's true of podcasting. Um, nothing is more jarring than hearing a, a, a screaming, poorly produced network radio style ad in the middle of an online stream because that's not uh, because those aren't typically heard in that environment. Right. And right. again, there's a lot of headphone listening, um, you know, whether it's active lean forward or passive lean back listening to audio. I think it's very important for the uh, the message and the execution and production of that message to mirror that container as much as possible. And so many times I hear ads that don't fit the container that they're given. 
uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So that would be my advice is there are a lot of incredible people at the creative groups of, of some of these companies. I've worked with many of them. Um, and they have an awful lot of research and I would believe it. Um, and it's not just research from us, it's research from uh, research that they've done themselves on receptivity of messaging like that. I would believe it. And, you know, there's there's kind of nothing worse to me than to be really into a podcast, let's say, that has, you know, incredible sound design. There's lots of audio production going on uh, and then have a, a screaming insurance commercial <laughs> pull me out of that in a most unwelcome way. And so yeah. that's that would be my number one message. Well, I think that that's the exact reason why when you're listening to most, you know, good podcasts, um, the commercials are support for this podcast is brought to you by because it's just a person talking. It doesn't have sound effects or, you know, music backgrounds or anything like that. It's fitting in that environment. So uh, that's where, where those come from. Brandon has a, a question here for you, Tom. iHeart pushes their traditional radio platform as a great place to advertise because they hit over 91% of Americans, uh, yet they push their podcast platform as number one for podcasting. Obviously, they make money in both places, but do these statements hurt advertisers trying to get to traditional radio listeners when they push listeners to podcasts and vice versa? Well, I think, you know, iHeart has built a formidable platform on the backs of its terrestrial radio reach. Uh, I'm not sure about 91%, um, but their terrestrial radio reach is formidable. And they have used that reach um, like an atomic clock every hour to advertise the iHeart platform, on, you know, the app on your phone and so on. Um, in terms of iHeart's reach in podcasting, uh, I can tell you that from a reach perspective, they're not number one. Um, you know, and, and I can share this only because they, uh, A, subscribe to the podcast consumer tracker and B, have announced it themselves. That, that would be Stitcher Midroll. Um, and, you know, Stitcher Midroll kind of rolling up Earwolf and, and a lot of the other things that they, that they own has a, has a greater reach. Um, you know, and, but there are a number of other audio platforms, you know, NPR, Rogan by himself, uh, <laughs> that, that really have that kind of reach that are in that kind of, I think ballpark as, as yeah. iHeart. Um, you know, iHeart does a really good job. I think um, bringing uh, they swing for the fences, you know, and that's something that Bob Pittman has done throughout his career. And that swinging for the fences, I think, has brought great attention to audio, great attention to the podcast space. Um, but there's a lot of room, you know. It's mm -hmm. a, podcasting, especially, is is very very fragmented. There's no one clear dominant force in podcasting. I will say that we calculated about a year ago in the podcast consumer tracker that if you bought the top five networks run of network, that you would reach 50% of weekly podcast consumers. Um, so that fragmentation maybe has gone down a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, in terms of a clear number one, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. So one of the uh, uh, reasons that I first fell in love with the infinite dial was the core, of course, it's tracking of social media usage. Uh, it's one thing uh, to take an idea to a client around, say, TikTok. It's another idea to take uh, that idea to them and say, TikTok usage is now at 23% of all Americans 12 and up. So here's the, the current data on uh, social media usage uh, for everyone to see. Uh, this is, um, I believe, uh, the percent of people who use the social media brand. Um, and, you know, Facebook has been dominant for a long time. Instagram continues to grow. Um, but I wonder, is, is there anything in this that you saw this year that was surprising or, um, you know, at least eyebrow raising? A couple of things. You know, first of all, Facebook has stalled and, and even declined a little bit. And that's a trend that we have seen really for the past couple of years. That's not a blip. Um, you know, I think it is notable that TikTok sits where it is, you know, sits either tied at or ahead of some platforms that have been around much, much longer. Um, you know, Twitter's growth has been fairly slow and steady over the past 10 years or so. It started with a bang and then, you know, it'll it'll pack on a percentage or two, uh, a percentage point or two every year. Same, you know, LinkedIn has been fairly stable, but uh, TikTok really came from, uh, you know, nowhere two years ago to, to where it is right now. So, you know, as... As I uh, age into being one of the olds, Jason, I, I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I'm rarely surprised by things. But that one uh, was a little bit surprising. And the other thing that really I think is the most 
uh, I don't know if you were going to show this or not, so I don't want to, because we haven't, have we ever met before? I feel like a bad magician. Um, <laughs> but the most eye raising, eyebrow raising stat in the whole social media section to me uh, is around the line of questioning which social media platform do you use the most? And we break that out by age. Uh, and that's it. You found it. That is How the one. How about that? How about that? Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, in total, for the first time in the history of the infinite dial, and we've been tracking social media for over a decade, Facebook is not said by the majority as the social media brand they use the most. It's the first time they've dipped below the majority. And you can see what drives that. It's 12 to 34. Uh, 12 to 34, you know, kind of overwhelmingly is, is going towards Instagram and uh, Snapchat. Now, one of the interesting things about this is you could say, well, they were smart to buy Instagram. I think that was a survival move because even when you put those two things together, it's not what Facebook was five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a, in a way that was sort of a survival move. And I, I think the question that you have to ask is, is social media like smoking? Like, do you have to do you have to get into <laughs> Facebook young uh, or or can you pick it up in your 30s? And I think that remains uh, kind of an open question. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I love the fact, by the way, on on this chart that you had uh, Parler in there just to illustrate its relevance or lack thereof, depending on which cable yep. news network is reporting the number. Um, but that does bring uh, into mind another question for me um, uh, back into the sort of audio side of things. I'm guessing Clubhouse wasn't a call out in this year's survey uh, just because it was so new. What's your take on it as a social network and as social audio as a movement? Does it warrant its own set of questions hmm. in 2022? And how do you determine new trends and what's worth inserting into a survey instrument like this? So we do have an ongoing tracking study of social media uh, called uh, The Social Habit, which is a name that you may remember from years past when we have done uh, kind of one-off studies under that name. Uh, but this is a survey that we have been doing continuously since uh, last November, where we're doing weekly tracking of all of the various social media platforms. And we did put out one release from that called Twitter Before and After Trump, uh, where we looked at Twitter and some other social media platforms uh, in the two weeks before January 8th and the two weeks following January 8th, which January 8th was the day that both President Trump um, and about 70,000 uh, purported QAnon accounts were all removed from Twitter and some attitudes about uh, the spreading of misinformation and, and trust issues. A lot of those things kind of changed. Uh, all that to say that we have been tracking Clubhouse um, and we just about have enough data now uh, to kind of meet our standards in terms of sample size and, and things like that to, to put something out on it, which we're going to do very, very shortly. Um, I have a number of thoughts about Clubhouse because I've, I've spent some time uh, kind of playing around with it and also looking at the preliminary data that we do have, which right now, I got to tell you, it's a lot of dudes, uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of dudes our age, regardless of what the rooms that kind of filter to the top are. Uh, it's a lot of people who really don't have a problem pushing themselves to the front of the room, uh, pushing themselves to the front of yet another. Uh, and I, I see Clubhouse really, I see two different Clubhouses. I, I see one aspect of Clubhouse, which is the aspect I really love, and that is the kind of social audio part of it, when I just open up a room for friends and, and a couple of people pop in. Uh, and that's less social audio network and more feature, honestly. My iPhone mm -hmm. should have that built in uh, to iMessage. Um, and I suspect that it someday will, yep. uh, someday soon. But then there's the other aspect to it, when you know an Elon Musk pops on, or I know Mitch Joel had Tom Peters on the other day, or Bob Pittman from My Heart was on. And they'll, you know, they'll come on at a scheduled time live. Mm -hmm. You have to be there. There'll be thousands of people in the room. There's very little interaction. It sounds like radio. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I don't, uh, I don't particularly think of that kind that style of clubhouse as social audio per se. What it really sounds like is if you put a hundred really smart radio people and a hundred really smart, uh, technologists, uh, in a room together with a stack of pizzas and a bunch of Mountain Dews for a few months, you'd probably get Clubhouse. Um, <laughs> and I think that aspect of it could be fun. Yeah. I, I, I had a problem with the term social audio yeah. as soon as I logged in for those reasons. I mean, you and I are both radio guys. And, you know, when you are in a situation where you essentially have what is a virtual version of a radio talk show, 
there's very little social about that for everyone. Right. There's there's some social interaction with the host and the couple of moderators and the six or eight people that make it up in a given span of time. And there are some moderators that do a great job of rotating a lot of people in and getting a lot of people involved, but it's really sitting and listening from an audience perspective. Yeah. And you might get to chime in every now and then, which is no different than calling in on a talk show and saying, go ahead, caller. And you say, ask your question, and then they hang up on you. Um, and then you go, yeah, and, you know, I, I think about, uh, you know, one of the radio shows that really launched a, a format in a lot of ways, personality driven sports talk. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, you know, that was really driven uh, years ago uh, on WFAN in New York by yep. these two hosts named Mike and the Mad Dog. They, yep. they essentially, um, if not invented that genre, popularized <laughs> that that genre for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But I would submit that as big a star as Mike and the Mad Dog were, Doris from Rigo Park, one of their frequent callers, was <laughs> yes. as big a star. And it's not like you heard 40 people an hour on that talk show. No. In fact, you probably heard about three. Much of oh, it yeah. was Mike and the Mad Dog kind of bloviating. But you would get that voice of Doris from Rigo Park and that would be the proxy for the listener. That would be the promise that there is a listener voice in the show. Yep. And it's not just two talking heads behind a microphone. Uh, and I think the best clubhouse rooms will do that. They will make you feel like you could be up there. Mm -hmm. You probably never will. Yep. But they make you feel like you could. And that makes you feel more connected to the show. Yeah, you, you've, you've almost drugged me into reminiscing on my sports talk radio days with the fabulous sports babe who was don't across cross town <laughs> at the time. Know a little thing or two about that show. But, yeah, that, I don't think anybody wants to hear us you know, talk on about that. Uh, as always, Tom, you keep us centered around the facts and informed of what consumers are doing. You are the backbone of the industry, sir, which I can assure you from experience is better than being backside. So thank you for the great work again. Uh, where can people find you and Infinite Dial on the interwebs? Sure. So uh, our research is published at edisonresearch.com. You can find me mostly on Twitter at Webby2001. That's the platform I am uh, active at the most. And if you click into my Twitter bio, you'll see a link to my newsletter. I put out an audio newsletter every week uh, on really on the digital audio space, a lot about podcasting, smart speakers, clubhouse. Uh, and that's where I think uh, these days some of my best thinking is going. Well, and and some of your uh, best reading, uh, I've shared the link also to Tom Reads His Spam on Apple Podcasts, because that might be my favorite podcast ever. And and I feel like even though you haven't updated it in a while, I've not. Uh, it, it's worth everyone spam going has to listen to. <laughs> I need to get better spam. Spam has changed. You know, I used to get there. There was a time when everybody got these like long lists of unrelated words as spam, <laughs> you know, like lobster, cappuccino, you know, those are fun to read. Um, but spam spam is less original sort of you know less engaging these days i have to say well i what i think what you should do is you should uh figure out a mechanism uh to record transcribe and then read the uh, telemarketer calls for your auto warranty i think that that's the next step for tom that's Reed's a good plan spam. i'm on it tom webster thank you so much for the time today sir i appreciate your contributions jason thank you and congrats on the book thank you very much i appreciate that tell your wife i said hello by the way all right Tom Webster, ladies and gentlemen, how about that? Uh, the Infinite Dial, go check it out. The links are there in, in the uh, chat section. Uh, I literally, It's religious for me. Every year uh, in March when they have the Infinite Dial, I've obviously subscribed to the email so I don't uh, miss it, uh, but um, they, they basically unveil that with a, a live webinar, and I, I literally open up a text document, and while Tom and, and John, I think, is the person from Triton are going through it, I'm, I'm typing notes, like, furiously, so that by the end of the hour, I can send out a recap to the people at Cornette so they can say, hey, here's the new consumer usage for all these platforms, because we can immediately incorporate that information into our thinking for our clients, and so I recommend everybody go and check that out. So uh, edisonresearch.com is the main website. And of course, you can find Tom on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Tom Reads His Spam on Apple Podcasts. They're with the links in the uh, chat section where you are. I'll also make sure those are in the uh, show notes, of course, on teamcornet.com afterwards. Okay, folks, in the uh, last year, both Google and Apple have led a movement to better protect consumer privacy. Google came out last year and said it planned to disavow 
uh, or disallow rather, third-party user data sharing in its browser, Google Chrome. It reaffirmed those plans this month. I'm going to drop a link uh, to the latest uh, missive from the folks at Google about what they're doing. In case you're curious, I'll put that in the uh, chat section as well and make sure that's in the show notes too. But Apple also disengaged third-party data in Safari last year, much to the chagrin of Facebook and other advertising networks. Now, in short, Some of the big tech companies do care about user privacy and are fighting to protect it. But that means that some of us in the advertising world are no longer going to have the powerful targeting capabilities we have become accustomed to. It will be more challenging to reach very targeted demographics of people across online media and other cookie-driven targeting platforms. Yes, Facebook and other networks can still deliver ads based on social targeting, so it's not the end of the world, but it does change it. So how are brands to adjust and account for ways to reach consumers most effectively? One voice in the advertising space says the answer is influencers. Christopher Penn, who we've had on the show before and is perhaps the most well-respected web analytics expert in the world that doesn't work for Google, authored an article on his website last week that says the closing of the third-party cookies door opens the influencer marketing door even more. He writes, and I quote, Highly targeted digital advertising is on the rocks as tracking changes will make life difficult for all but the biggest ad tech companies. In turn, that will drive prices for advertising up on the big ad networks like Google and Facebook. For some companies, it could price them out of the market. Influencer marketing stands to benefit. Audiences tend to be well-defined around an influencer's area of expertise, and those audiences are behavior-based, not demographic-based. The power of an influencer's audience is that it isn't limited by demographics. So like social targeting on uh, networks like Facebook, influencer marketing can be leveraged to reach a more relevant consumer. As Chris points out in his article, if you want to target an audience of people interested in writing, Anne Hanley is a great influence channel to reach them. If tech strategy is your thing, he says Crystal Washington's audience is a goldmine. Reinventing education. Dr. I. Addison Zhang's audience is good for you. Self-improvement, Laura Gassner Odding has a captive audience there. I'm working on an activation for a client right now who wants to reach people who dig making pizza at home. Well, guess what? I've got a list of six to eight YouTubers and online content creators who talk directly to guess who? People who make pizza at home. If you or your company are still hemming and hawing over influencer marketing, thinking it's a fad or not really seeing the risk reward equation leaning to your favor, you need to pay attention because it's about to become incredibly relevant for you. Of course, if you want to understand influencer marketing a little better, I know, I know, I know a book that might, might help. Uh, Find Christopher Penn's article online at ChristopherPenn.com. Let me drop that link into the, Uh, chat as well. So you can see that and go click through and read uh, his perspective on the matter. Um, I think that's something we all need to be uh, cognizant of and thinking about as we think about how are we going to continue to reach relevant audiences with our paid uh, advertising spend. If you are watching or listening to the show after the fact along the C-Suite network or via one of the video recordings online, remember we typically broadcast this podcast with a live stream. To join us live, follow me or Cornette on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, or look for Digging Deeper on YouTube, and you'll get that handy live notification when we stream. That's normally at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific on Tuesday mornings. Look for me online at Jason Falls. You can typically find Cornette online at Team Cornette. If you'd like a really handy, quick link to get over to the YouTube channel to subscribe there, that's cornet.online slash dig deep. For those of you who are watching on the live stream this morning uh, or the video replay later, subscribe to the audio podcast version to never miss uh, a a show. Uh, That is at cornet.online slash digging deeper. So spell it all out for the audio. Dig deep is for the YouTube channel. Cornet.online slash digging deeper will get you to the player for the podcast and a place where you can subscribe to the audio version of the show. You can also search for Digging Deeper Cornet on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, I would recommend uh, searching for Digging Deeper Cornet. There's a couple of other shows that are either Dig Deep or Digging Deeper or some version of it. Uh, And so we're in there with a couple of other people. We really wanted to name the show Digging Deeper. And there's a little Easter egg here. The reason we wanted to name the show Digging Deeper is the poster over my shoulder is kind of our three sort of core pillars of what we do. 
uh, as employees at Cornette. And number one right up there is dig deeper. We also love the challenge and we also try to do right by the brand at all. Uh, not just Cornette's brand, our clients' brands. So there you go. It's kind of the evolution of the name if you were interested in that. Okay, uh, next week on the show, uh, don't forget our new start time, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific time, live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. At that time next Tuesday, April 6th, we'll have a chat with author Margot Bloomstein. Her new book is called Trustworthy, How the Smartest Brands Beat Cynicism and Bridge the Trust Gap. Can't wait to dig into her ideas. Super smart when she is, and she'll be here to share some knowledge with us as well. That will be live on the interwebs on Tuesday, April 6th at the new time, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. If you can't be there live, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Again, that is at cornet.online slash dig deep. Uh, or you can jump over and subscribe to the audio feed and podcast at cornet.online slash digging deeper. And now we have come to the point in the program where, as those of you who have been watching or listening uh, along for quite some time know, that we are most prone to user error because this is where Jason has to hit three or four buttons to get us out of here. And I normally mess this up. So I'm going to hit one, two, and I think this is the third. I might have done it right this week. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. Make creativity your business advantage. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornet Group. Find us online at teamcornet.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler. Creative director is Jason Majeski. Associate producer is Ashley Harris. Our theme music is composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, I'll see you on the interwebs. <laughs>